Hi guys, my name is Rado and today I'm going to show you how to build a simple tic-tac-toe game. Uh, this is going to be pretty exciting, so get ready. First thing first, I'm going to show you how the app is going to look like. Here's my Android emulator and well, let's imagine that I'm trying to play and well, player 2 wins. Actually, uh, this is a player versus player game, so <clears throat> I'm playing on the same device. So I just uh, won the game against myself. Good for me. Okay, uh, so now in order to get started, uh, you need to have uh, Android SDK installed on your computer. So you can open a browser and write Android SDK or I recommend that you use Android Studio as an IDE because it is also recommended by Google and it comes with a pretty broad variety of uh, predefined tools in order to make the process of building your applications easier. So just write Android Studio and open this link. You can download it from here. The process of installation is pretty straightforward. So you, once you uh, finish with uh, downloading the file, you can just extract it and, and uh, the installation guide will walk through the steps. Well, uh, once you have everything uh, which you need in order to get started, you will open the, the Android Studio, which I have here and we will need to start uh, to create a new project basically we need to go to file new new project and we can give our game some interesting name i will just stick with, with tic tac toe here you will specify your company domain in case you don't have uh, one you can just improvise uh, you can write your name or something. Uh, this is required by Google because uh, you need to have uh, a, a unique ID which uh, will distinguish your app from uh, the others in the Google Play Store. So this is uh, going to uh, make your package name like this. Once you are done with this step you can go uh, on the next step. Here you uh, can choose the the compatibility with uh, other Android versions. Uh, so our application is going to support every device device which runs Android 4.0.3, which is basically all the devices. So you can stick with with it because we are not going to use uh, some specific API APIs or some cool Google stuff which they have released very soon. So you can just stick with this. Here you select empty activity and you click next. You, here you can uh, name your first activity name. You can just call it game activity or player versus player game activity or something descriptive which uh, uh, will uh, make a hint to other programmers what you were doing. After that you can uh, click the finish button. Uh, in my case I already have the project done and I'll click cancel. So once you are, once you are done uh, you will have your new project and you are ready to get started. So, uh, first things first, what is an activity? An activity is basically the main screen, the first thing which you see once you open an application in Android. Uh, it has a specific life cycle and it would be a good idea that we actually go through this life cycle real quickly. La life cycle of activity Android. Let's see how many typos I made. Whoa. 
a lot. Okay, so basically the first thing which uh, happens once we open an activity, we go on the onCreate method. This is uh, where act the process is uh, created in, in your system. Uh, all the UI elements and uh, all the application logic is not ready yet. It is uh, yet to get prepared on the following methods. On the onStart, on, on the onStart method, uh, your application is pretty much ready to, uh, well, to be usable. And on the, once on the onResume method, uh, it is already done with its loading and it expects the user to interact with it. Then, uh, when you when you are about to to queue the, the application, you go through on pause, where uh, all the information data is saved uh, because the user might want to come back to your application once again. Then the on stop method is caught. This is when the activity is no longer visible. It is about to get destroyed by the system. Here are a few more cases, but we are not going to go through them right now because they are not really relevant to our application. Well, this is the application lifecycle. Now we can go to our code editor <coughs> again and we can start with our own create, own create method, which again is the first thing which is called right after the application is loaded. Uh, that's pretty good for now. The first thing which we need to do when we go in this method is to call the supers on create method. Uh, what uh, what does uh, this keyword mean? This is a pointer to our super class, to our parent class, which is in our case app compat activity. This is uh, generated by default when you select uh, empty activity. In order to see its code, you can uh, hold command or control if you are using a Windows or Linux machine. You hold command or control and you left click it. And you see this is basically the code of an activity. What does this mean is basically, uh, well, everything which is uh, which needs to be done, like loading in the memory or uh, initializing uh, UI elements. Uh, this is basically done uh, for us by the system. This is why we need to call the onCreate method here. Uh, actually, this is going to be predefined for you. Uh, and you won't have to write it. The, uh, won't you won't have to uh, do this by yourself. However, it is always a good idea to understand it. Well, the next thing which happens is uh, we're going to set our content view. So basically we're going to load uh, all of our UI elements. And uh, I have selected this file. Uh, you write r.layout the uh, the layout file where you are your UI elements are stored. Uh, if you want to open this file, you can again click command and left click on it. And here you'll see how your elements are structured. If you click design uh, here on the bottom left, uh, the, the Android Studio is going to actually render the screen for uh, for you. You won't have to build your application in order to see what's going on. But uh, let's go over uh, what uh, all of this stuff means. Uh, well, we have a parent element which is called relative layout in our case. Uh, I chose this one because uh, it is uh, the easiest one in order to start learning about uh, the Android op operating system. And 
it is pretty simple to use. Basically, all the elements are uh, placed relative to each other. This means that I can uh, add here one more element, say a button. And I can say, well, this button needs to be right below, right below this table here. If I don't specify this, uh, it will put it on the first position of the screen which it sees. In our case, it will just put it right here, right at the beginning, on the top left. Uh, and in my case, I just uh, uh, create a table layout which contains uh, exactly three rows. Each of uh, each of uh, these rows contain a text view. A text view is basically a simple text, which by default has no text in it. But I spe specify an ID, uh, which uh, will uh, make our connection between this layout file and our Java code. Uh, we will uh, go into this IDs deeper uh, at some point later in our video. Let's first explore what does this style attribute here means. Uh, command click on it and you'll see that I have specified everything which is uh, like in common for this uh, text views. In, a, in one single style class. Uh, each view has, uh, I believe, exactly two required attributes, layout width and layout height. In my case, the layout width is zero uh, dp. Uh, why zero? Because uh, here we have uh, Weight sum, which basically means that I'm saying, hey, each of uh, these text views ha uh, have to, uh, has to uh, has to occupy exactly one third, exactly one third of uh, the whole screen's uh, width, because I, I specify that one element has a weight of one, the whole row has a weight of three, if each of these text views has a weight of one, it will occupy exactly one third. And if you open uh, your screen, you'll see that it is, it looks like uh, what we expect it to look. Each of uh, these little squares occup occupies exactly one third of the screen's width, which is a pretty simple way to make our layout work. Great. Uh, let's see what else uh, we have in our style. Uh, here we specify the text size, that the text needs to be in the center. Uh, okay. Uh, in order to make it uh, look a bit better, we will we'll need this. A tiny border uh, so it actually looks like a grid we'll have to make this border by ourselves we can create a simple drawable I'll open the one I, I have already created by command clicking on it and it is a pretty simple one I basically say that hey I want a shape uh, which is going to be a, a rectangle with a width of uh, 2 dp. By the way, dp is a unit which is uh, re relative to the density per inch of uh, your screen. Uh, never use pixels because uh, they're, uh, they're going to look really ugly on some devices. You never want to use pixels basically. Uh, so you might want to use density per inch. 2dp is uh, a border which is not really uh, thick, 
it looks like this one. Uh, here I can specify the color. It is always a great idea to uh, extract all of these color resources in a single file. I can do that by uh, clicking the option button and enter when my cursor is on the color resource and click extract color resource. I can give it a name like say gray and it's going to be extracted for us in this colors.xml file. Great. Uh, what else do we have here? Let's go a bit deeper in this uh, table. Uh, here I say that I want I wanted to take basically the whole screen space because here we have two predefined attributes. The first one is match parent, which basically means occupy the whole screen. In this case, the whole screen is width. In this case, the whole screen the whole screen height. I can also use rough content, which means use as much as you want to or as much as you need to. It is usually useful when we want to display an image because uh, we never know what is uh, exactly its uh, resolution. So if we say I want an image with a wrap attribute width and height, it will use as much space as uh, it needs in order to look good on your screen. Okay, here I specify the number of columns I need, here I specify that I need this guy to be in the center because I want it to look well symmetrical. And what else do we have here? We have this little text view which uh, which uh, shows the player uh, who, who needs to make the move. You can see this text here. Right now player 1 is playing and it shows its uh, symbol. Now it is uh, going to turn to the other to the other player. Okay, great. I believe we are uh, ready to jump again in our Java code and explore what happens next. Uh, we have uh, a variable of type player which uh, contains player 1 and player 2. This is uh, uh, for the sake of simplicity so our code is less error prone. Uh, we have uh, a variable which uh, can store either player1 or player2. In our case this is the variable now playing. And we initialize it with a random value. Uh, you can call new random and you can call the next boolean function. And if it returns uh, a value of true uh, the first player who is going to play is uh, player 1. Uh, if this is not the case, and if you don't get a value of true, you get a value of false. Then player 2 is going to play. This is a really short, uh, shorthand notation for if something else. This is basically... Here we have basically... Uh, this part here and here goes in the else block and here this is our condition. Th this is just a brief reminder in case you are not familiar with this shorthand notation. Okay, now the next step is to initialize our UI elements. As I said a few minutes ago, uh, in our layout file, we specified these IDs here uh, so we can 
so we can uh, access our UI elements in our code. And here I get the reference to to my whole table. Here I get the reference to the text, and and I get the reference uh, for each of uh, this for each of these tiny squares here. So I can always know which square I'm actually selecting. And let's see what happens next. Once I'm done with all of the initial uh, of the well, let's say collecting the references, I put all of the texts in a two-dimensional array. Uh, I believe this is uh, the most simple way to uh, to achieve our uh, desired goal because. Uh, we can always know which column has been clicked and when each row has been clicked. Uh, in case uh, you are not familiar with uh, two-dimensional arrays, let's make a brief reminder. I'll open something somewhere I can draw maybe. Hmm. Let's do it on the internet. Paint online. And let's imagine that we have our grid because it looks something like this. It looks something like this. And in order to uh, make things easier, each of these uh, tiny squares has an index. The first one is zero, uh, zero and zero, which me which basically means that we are on the row with an index of zero and column of index of zero. Remember, uh, arrays in Java start from zero. So if you see two zeros, this means that you are on the very, very first element. Again, this specifies the row and the second number specifies the column. Okay, uh, similarly, similarly, you have 0, 1 because we are still on the same row. And then we have 0, 2. This square here has a position of 0, 2. Then we are going on the next row which is 1, 0. Here we have 1, 1 and here we have oops, 1, 2. A new row once again, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2. Okay, uh, what we have for now is uh, some meaningful way to uh, to keep track of uh, what the user is clicking on. So right now, if I if I say I want you to give me the this the little tiny square which is which is located on position zero zero, I get I get this one here. Uh, Okay, this is uh, basically our UI and now we can continue with the next step. Uh, here we have the most complex part of our code. Uh, here we need to go through each of, uh, through each of uh, these tiny squares and we need uh, uh, to somehow uh, tell them their indexes. Uh, for this, uh, for this sake, I uh, create a variable which uh, starts from zero, and when I iterate through each of uh, these items, 
basically these twines, twines mean well go through each of these squares and set them set them attack of each number between 0 and 8 so I convert I convert each of these indexes uh, to some number. This is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. And then I say, well, I want each of uh, these tiny squares uh, to be clickable. So this means that when the user uh, clicks or taps on this square, I want something to happen. What do I want to happen is specified in, in the body of this onClick method. It is this piece of code here. So let's explore it a bit deeper. Once the user clicks on some of the squares, uh, the first thing which we need to check is whether it is uh, an empty box. Because you know, if we have uh, uh, if, if we have already selected this box and if the next player is playing I don't want just to click here and to remove my friend's uh, turn that's going to be cruel and unfair this is why we forbid this action we basically say hey but uh, you can uh, put your symbol here if and only if it is uh, empty so basically if the text here is, basically if there's no text here. Uh, the next thing we, which we need to do, uh, we will need to know the symbol to put. So as I said before, we have decided which player is going to play first, here. Now we will use uh, this guy's symbol by calling this method here and we'll check if uh, player 1 is playing uh, give me his symbol in our case it is basically this X here and uh, change the order of the players so basically uh, uh, so basically switch the turns the next player to play is going to be player 2 and on the other side is if player 2 is playing right now give me his symbol and uh, give the player once uh, the next turn okay sounds great uh, and once we are done we are ready to put the symbol in in our tiny square after that we can update this indication of who is uh, playing next for this sake we call this method which uh, uh, gives us uh, a string which we can uh, set to our text this string is based on the player who is uh, going to play now. As you remember, we have already switched the players on this method here. And now we check if player 1 is going to play next. Uh, give us uh, the string which says player 1 is uh, needs to put uh, a symbol right now. I basically compute the string by using a few resources which I have defined in my strings.xml file and I return back this string okay the next we, the thing we, which we need to do is to get to know uh, which uh, which uh, index we have to click on because as you see we don't specify a new onclick uh, action for each of uh, these squares we use the same logic for every square 
And this is why we need to know the, the index of the one which, which uh, we have uh, clicked on. For this sake, I have uh, this number to 2D index. And I'm going to explain what this method does. So, as you remember, we have uh, set all the, all the numbers between 0 and 8 uh, to match the indexes of uh, two numbers. So, basically, uh, this tag here, this tag here, will be equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So, I pass this index to uh, to this method and what it does is uh, here I do some simple mathematics which I'm going to explain really briefly uh, let's imagine that we have that we have this number here let's say it is the index of 7 which is uh, this uh, square here uh, in order to get these two numbers here, so we need to make the conversion of uh, this one number to two numbers. Uh, in order to get the first number, we can basically uh, divide 7 by 3. 3 is uh, the number of rows here. And if we divide it, we'll get, well, 7 divided by 3 is two and we get uh, the number of the row uh, we completely ignore the uh, the digits after the decimal sign because we divide in integers and when you divide integers the result is always an integer this is why you get a result of two uh, and when you get the, rem the remainder of uh, this division, you, you get 1. Why? Because 7 divided by 3 is 6. 7 uh, minus 6 is 1. And you get the number of the row and the number of the column of the square in, uh, in our grid. Well, there is one more way to think about it. You can start uh, subtracting trees uh, as long as you can. So basically, if you have uh, seven, uh, uh, as in our example, you will subtract three and you will get four. Then you will uh, subtract uh, three once again and, and you will get one. If you subtract uh, three from one, you will get some negative number. So we will stop up to here. And we'll count how many times we subtract it. Exactly two times. This is the number of the row. And here we get one. This is basically the number of the column. This was one more way to think about uh, this piece of code here. I explained this just in case uh, you cannot recall how to work with two dimensional arrays. Well, we, uh, we collect uh, the result in a simple array and we'll g g uh, pass it back to our onClick method. And the first number is uh, the number of the row and the second number is the number of the column. And here I say, say uh, in this uh, array here, uh, put the symbol uh, which the previous player has used. So here is a simulation of my board once again. After that I will uh, have an indication of how many symbols have been put on the board so far. It starts from zero and it counts how many uh, clicks have been made. And here comes perhaps the most interesting part of, of uh, our game. Uh, we can check whether we have a winner. 
we can have a winner if uh, somebody has played on the board. If uh, I have put a, a next here, I'll just uh, check if there is such a combination of uh, X's uh, which uh, makes me a winner because this guy here cannot win if it was my turn. So there is really no point in checking whether both players uh, um, have such a combination. So I basically check the symbol which uh, has been already put. Okay, uh, let's uh, explore uh, what does it mean to be a winner. We have uh, an entire new class here which you can find in your you open your app folder then you go in the Java folder and your projects folder. You don't need these two folders for now. You just need to create a new class in order uh, for your code to, to look a bit more clean, uh, cleaner and you open your board uh, Java class and here you pass this two-dimensional array and you, you tell it please check if uh, we have a winner uh, and we specify uh, the guy which, uh, who we are checking. Let's say we are checking whether we have such a combination of X's which make me a winner. Basically there are, I believe, four ways uh, for me to be a winner. Let's take a look at our grid here. Uh, if I make uh, a row which uh, has only axes, if I make uh, a cone which ha uh, has only axes, if this diagonal is filled with axes or this diagonal, these are four ways for me to be a winner. And if at least one of these conditions is satisfied, I am a winner. And uh, what we need to do is to go through each of these squares and as, ask them uh, if they are filled with an X. We do, we do that by uh, going through each of, uh, each of the rows and each of the columns. So I will make this a bit smaller and let's go through this nested for loop. When I run this on the current board, I'll, guess, uh, I'll basically get the index of this, this and this. Uh, and if uh, the value of uh, the element here is equal to x, uh, I'll say uh, a, uh, this uh, element here is an x. So increment this counter by 1 uh, and we'll count whether this counter uh, has a value of uh, 3 because if we go uh, through an entire row and we, we reach uh, the value of 3 of uh, this variable here this, mean, this means that uh, the entire row is filled by, by x's I specified this value in my constant class. I recommend that you do that because it, it makes your code uh, easier to be to be supported. Because uh, at some point in your career as software developers, you have maybe tons of uh, constants and some numerical values and you cannot keep track on them if they are uh, all through your code so you can just put them in a single file like this okay if this condition is satisfied say okay we have a winner this guy here wins if uh, this does not happen definitely this return st statement will be executed and we will know that we don't have such a row 
where, uh, which contains only X's. Uh, okay, then we will need to go through each of the cons. So we have uh, pretty much, uh, pretty much uh, the opposite logic in this in this nested for loops. We'll go through each of the through each of the of the rows. Oh well, I'm sorry. Through each of the columns, and ask whether the element on each row has on Lexis. So basically, we'll go here, then here, and then here, and increment this variable uh, if and only if it uh, the, va the value here is an x. Uh, if uh, this does not happen, we'll go on the next column and make uh, the same checks. Uh, once we are finished with uh, these checks, we are ready to say whether this condition is, is uh, satisfied. Uh, here are a few more simple uh, traversal, traversals of uh, this array. We will need uh, to check this diagonal here. Okay, I uh, observed that uh, uh, some college students uh, struggle with understanding uh, the concept of uh, traversing the diagonals. Okay, let's explore uh, the logic behind it. Let's open our, our picture of indexes and observe what, what uh, we have in common between these elements. Uh, here they are. They are the element on position of 0, 0, 1, 1 and 2, 2. Uh, what they have in common is that the, uh, the index of their row equals to the index of their column. So what we can do is to basically uh, go through each of uh, say the rows and use the same index in order to get this element so this for loop here uh, will go through this element because the value of i is going to be zero then it's going to be one then it's going to be two and it counts uh, the number of elements if there are three uh, the player wins uh, the logic behind uh, checking this diagonal here is a bit more complex. Let's open our picture and see what they have in common. Here we have 0, 2, 1, 1 and 2, 0. Maybe you can see that they are kind of uh, the reflection of each other. Uh, so when this increases by 1, you see here it was 0, then it, it becomes a 1. Uh, then the number of the number of uh, the cone decreases by 1. It was 2, now it is 1. So their sum is always going to be it's always going to be 2. Remember we are we are in a zero based array. So 0 plus 2 is 2. 1 plus, uh, 1 plus 1 is uh, 2, so we have always the sum of 2. So once again, we can uh, use uh, just uh, one for loop. Of course we can uh, as well use two for loops, but, uh, but it really makes no sense. We can just use one for loop and then we can subtract from 3. We can subtract 1, so we can get a 2, because we are in a zero-based array. Actually, let me again make a simple table. Here are going to be the values of phi, which is the index of the row. And here we are going to have the indexes of j. And j is equal to, it is a function of phi and it is equal to 
3 min minus 1 minus psi. Uh, as I said, 3 minus 1, because if we have a value of 0 here, we will need to have a value of 2 here. Okay, let's explore the cases. If we have a value of 0 here, we are going to get a value of, of 2, because 3 minus 1 minus 0 is 2. If we have 1, we will get 3 minus 1 minus 1, it is a 1. If we have a 2 here, we are going to get uh, 3 minus 1 minus 2 is 0. So we have 0, 2, 1, 1 and 2, 0, which is basically, which basically satisfy our uh, condition. So we can use this formula. This is basically no, uh, the, no, the number 3 here. We subtract i from it and we subtract 1. And the same logic goes for this traversal. And this method here will go through each of these traversals and will give us the result. Once it has been completed we can we can simply go back to our activity class and let's see what happens next. If we have uh, a winner we will uh, reset this counter here which uh, was counting how many symbols we have on our board. Right now it should have a value of 3, right now it should have a value of, of 4 and whatsoever. Well, if we have a winner, we'll show this dialog here. Uh, it will compute a string uh, which uh, will contain the name of uh, the player who has won the game. Let's see the dialog, if I put a no here, player 2 wins. Because uh, this was the guy who uh, has put uh, his symbol uh, last. Okay, this is how we make this simple message. We use this toast class and we call, oops, make text method and we pass the context, this string here, and for how long we need this text to show. We have two predefined constants here, toast dot length long or length short. It's up to you. And don't forget to, to call this show method. Next, I want to have some delay between uh, restarting our game and um, showing this message. So I make a simple timer which uh, will make a delay of 2 seconds and again don't forget to call the start method and once it has, fi once it has finished it calls this restart game method. What it basically does is it uh, needs to reset the values, the initial values of our arrays and uh, to, re to erase all the content. This is everything it does. And we are almost, we have almost finished. We only need to explore what happens if we have no winner. Basically nothing happens apart from switching on the next player. Uh, we have just uh, we have just one exception. If we have already made, uh, uh, if we have already put nine symbols here, which is uh, three multiplied by three, this is uh, our uh, all the squares in my grid. We will need to say that we have uh, a draw game, and we again need to restart the game. 
Okay. Uh, this is all the logic behind a simple tic-tac-toe game. Uh, well, I believe that we can export it and uh, I will explain how to upload it in Google Play. So you can click on this build button here and select generate signed APK. Once you do this, you want you really want to build module app. You click next, and then you need to create uh, a certificate for uh, for your application. Uh, if you don't have one, you need to select this create new button. You specify its path. It's uh, you specify a password and you make an alias for uh, its data. Again, you need to uh, select a password for it. I recommend that these two passwords, these two passwords are different for the sake of uh, being more secure. Uh, we need this certificate so that uh, Google Play knows uh, that, that uh, you are the one who has modified your application. And well, once you have made your certificate, uh, please uh, store it on a secure place in your computer or in your GitHub account. Write down your password, password securely and uh, keep it because if you make a new version of your application and you make uh, a build, you will need to use the same certificate. Uh, if you don't do so and you sign uh, the same application with a different certificate, Google Play will say, uh, well, I'm not sure if you are the developer, so it won't you allow you to upload a new version. So please keep your certificate on a secure place. Uh, once you have done this, you choose your uh, uh, the path of your certificate and you will write its passwords. Okay, then you will click next and actually let me do that. I will write my password here. Then uh, you need to uh, select that you are making a release build and then you uh, you need to make sure that these two uh, checkboxes have been selected. Then you just need to click finish. And your APK, fa APK fail is about to be built. So you will wait a few seconds uh, until this process is finished. Uh, for the first build, it should not ta take more than, say, 30 seconds, depending on your machine. Okay, uh, while my computer is building it, let's go in our, in our browser and see the steps we need, which we need to take in order to upload it in Google Play. Uh, you need to simply write developer console in Google. You select the first result. And you will have to set up your uh, your um, your developer account. Uh, I believe uh, there is a, a fee of uh, $25. Uh, you will need to pay it only once and you will have your developer account set up. Uh, Google will uh, guide you through the steps which you need to take in order to purchase your developer account. Uh, once you have done that, you can cli click this create application button and you will select a name tic tac to. and you can provide some information about your application. You ha ha have to write a short description 
which appears right here. Let's open an example in Google Play Store. Let's say some popular applications such as Messenger. You'll see its short description is written here, reach anyone and some other text. Uh, it is basically a one-liner uh, to explain really briefly what your application does. Here you can write uh, some more descriptive details about your, your application and then you are required to provide at least two screenshots. You can provide a few screenshots from your phone, from your tablet and uh, whatever you are building your application for. You need to provide a high resolution icon which will be displayed here. You will have to provide a features graphic. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't see the features graphic. Uh, in this version of Google Play, but it is basically a cover image which appears somewhere here. Let me check some other application. I really don't see it, but but uh, it is a graphic which appears on the header of of uh, the screen somewhere here. Here you have a few more graphics which you are not required to add, but uh, you can always uh, do this in some point later. Uh, you will have to select the application type, its category. Uh, you have to complete a short survey which will ask you a few details about the application's content, so Google Play can uh, give you certificates uh, and then you have some contact details and uh, privacy policy uh, you don't have to submit it uh, uh, at this point but once you are about to make a release on google play you will have to provide a link uh, so i advise you that you uh, write down a document which uh, explains your privacy policy and upload it somewhere on the web. You can uh, get a free hosting plan somewhere from the internet or you can uh, purchase one. It's up to you. Once you are done with this, yes, I click yes here, you can go you can go to up release section and here you can you can release your app uh, to production if you want to you can uh, first release it only for a few testers on different channels here you'll simply have to hit create release and and Okay, you will uh, you will select your APK uh, APK file from uh, from here. You can uh, write here something like initial re release, and when you are uploading a new version, you can always write here about your changes. Once you're done with that, I'm going to switch to another application so we can really see the other steps. You can hit store presence. Uh, I'm sorry, you can hit, well, pricing and distribution and you, he, here you specify whether you want your application to be free or to be paid. Uh, you can also specify the countries which uh, where it is uh, available from 
this button here. And once you're done with this, you can uh, you can go on your dashboard. You have the button to submit your app. It will take uh, some time for Google to process your request to see whether you satisfy all the conditions. Uh, and once it uh, goes through this process, you will see your app live on Google Play. And you will have your first app on the Google Play Store. Uh, I believe we have uh, uh, we have gone through all the steps for building and uh, publishing this application on Google Play. So if you, f if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, have a nice day.